Well, thank you everyone for joining us at this post-lunch session. We've entitled this panel, Reshaping Palestinian Narrative. I don't have to look at my notes written down there. Who is listening and can it make a difference? My name is Daniel Levy. I chair the US Middle East Project. I'd like to thank the Doha Forum for co-hosting this panel, for having this as part of their program. And I'm going to introduce you to the panelists. I'm going to introduce our theme a little bit. We're going to kick off a conversation. We're going to keep that going. If we can, we're going to bring in voices from the floor as well. So we have with us, and I'll go in order of how we're going to speak and in seating order. First, Fadi Quran. Fadi is a campaign director at Avaz, an international campaigning organization many of you may be familiar with. Fadi is also an activist in the West Bank. He was a community organizer. He started his career at Al Haq, Palestinian human rights organizations. And he has the dubious record of having been arrested by both the Israeli and PA authorities. Next to Fadi is Diana Butu, and they share some things in common, and one of them is where they started their respective careers, because Diana is also a veteran of Al Haq. Diana is a Palestinian lawyer, academic, and analyst. She now works for the IMEU, the Institute for Middle East Understanding, for Dawn, Democracy for the Arab World Now. And in a previous life, you were an advisor uh, and a legal advisor to the PLO negotiating team. Peter Beinart is editor-at-large at Jewish Currents, which is a publication also online, of course. He is an American academic and author. He is a columnist at the New York Times. And I'd be remiss if I didn't remind this audience that you can sign up for his newsletter on Substack. Next to Peter and our final panelist, is Baroness Saida Warsi, whose accent will be a bit more similar to mine. Saida Warsi is a member of the House of Lords in the UK. When she was sworn in, she became the youngest peer. She was also the first British Muslim to serve in the cabinet. She is an activist. She runs a foundation. And I'm very, very pleased that you're with us on this panel, Saida. So we're br bringing this together, and, and, and we've set up the kind of theme of this panel to reflect almost a year since the, what is known in Palestinian circles, I think, as the unity intifada. I think often in many places it's seen as yet another round of violence and suffering, but it had some somewhat different features from what we'd seen in the past, including the geographical span of this assertion of Palestinian rights and, in many ways, fed upness with the reality on the ground. But in many respects, we've slipped back into a business as usual. But there were things that happened then that I perhaps want us to pull on as a, as a beginning of thread which is we began to hear a somewhat different Palestinian narrative, a narrative that was not new in Palestinian circles, and I have to make that absolutely clear, but it was perhaps permeating parts of Western consciousness and getting uh, a resonance in mainstream media and in social media that had not been the case in the past. Subsequent to that, there's been a new Israeli government, not much has changed, despite there being a new government on that front. There have been a number of interesting reports of a similar theme issued following from work that Palestinian organizations conducted for many years, but issued in the last year by the blue chip um, international human rights organizations, both making a designation of apartheid as regards the reality under which Palestinians live, and that came from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. And again, part of this sense of a shifting narrative. And what I'd like to start to dig into, and I want to start with you, Fadi, is do you see shifts in terms of the
the way you're talking about this issue, the way you're acting on that, and the theory of political change that that can lead to. And I'm asking you that as someone who's on the ground in the occupied West Bank. Fadi Karam. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you all for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure. So to answer that question, what I would begin with is the core shift happening on the ground in Palestine is the return of a sense of agency, which is that particularly within the younger generation of Palestinians, but I think across society, we're shifting from a narrative of dependency, the sense, you know, there's a usual refrain, when el malayin, where are the millions, that was oftentimes referred to where the Arabs around the world, and then there's been this kind of, uh, we need a peace process that is led from outside, somebody needs to put pressure on Israel, etc., etc. And the shackles of that dependency, the shackles of those expectations are falling on the ground and Palestinians are beginning to say, our destiny is in our hands and we're going to take control of it. And you can see that language, that shift in discourse. Many of you, I'm sure when you followed the Sheikh Jarrah events, you, you followed Muna al-Kurd, Muhammad al-Kurd, you saw that language, you saw that sense of struggle. And for the last 30 years, that has almost been suffocated and sidelined, but now it's back to the fore and it's defining the language on the ground. The second shift is the shift of how Palestinians view the Palestinian Authority. And in terms of the narrative here, what's happening is that the Palestinian Authority is almost now not seen by the majority of, of Palestinians as the leadership, they're seen as rulers, coercive rulers, but they're not seen as leaders. And the question now with on the ground is, how do we create a, a kind of new leadership that actually represents the Palestinian people and get rid of the functionality of the Palestinian Authority, which serves in many ways as a subcontractor. And that has become clearer, and it has become the clearest after the events in May. And last but not least, and I think this is the central shift in, in my personal opinion, Palestinians for years and years have been divided into the Palestinians in the West Bank, the Palestinians in Gaza, the Palestinians living in 1948 in Israel, the Palestinians in Lebanon, etc., etc., etc. And kind of those divisions in terms of how we view ourselves are beginning to break down. There are nodes of Palestinians' interconnectedness focusing on we're one people, we have one struggle across the world, and we're going to move in that direction. And I think all those come together in, in a unified form to challenge the system of domination that is Israeli apartheid today. And I think it's a very hopeful moment. I would even verge on saying it's a moment of renaissance in the context of the Palestinian struggle moving forward. Thanks very much, Fadi. Diana, your, your background means that you've come, at least from having been involved on the other side, on the kind of negotiations track, and geographically, you're situated on the other side of what well, in some respects is an increasingly imaginary line, 67 line, uh, being in Haifa. Fadi just referred, in fact, to overcoming the divisions and what happened also with the 48 community. So can you reflect on, on that same arc from, from your experience and from where you're sitting? Yes. Um, first, I want to thank you, Daniel, for putting together this panel. And I want to thank you all for attending and, uh, and to the Doha Forum for inviting me. Um, in terms of what's happening, I, I very much share Fadi's sentiment about there being a shift. But I, I want to be a little bit cautious on a certain a, a few things. The first is I wholeheartedly agree that we have shifted from being uh, focusing on peace process and from being helpless to now focusing instead on agency and having our own agency. Um, and I think that that's a very important shift. The, the, my participation in the negotiations was not um, for many, many years, but within that short period of time, I realized that it was futile. It was the equivalent of negotiating with somebody when they have a gun to your head. Um, so we knew that very, very well on. But the, I think there's one thing that is, a, that is uh, perhaps I might differ with you a little bit on, Fadi, which is that people have made this, they've used the term unity intifada. Um, as though there had never really been unity in the past, whereas I, as somebody who lives in Haifa, which means I hold um, Israeli citizenship, even though I'm Palestinian, I, we've been essentially part of the struggle from day one. 
And we've felt the occupation not only in our day-to-day -day lives, but we feel it on our skin virtually every day. For example, I can tell you countless examples of, of me, me and others being at protests where we saw the full weight of Israeli brutality come against us, whether that was in October of 2000 when 13 Palestinian citizens of Israel were gunned down, many of them were shot in the back because they were protesting the, uh, the Intifada, or in 2014, 2009 or 2014, or, or virtually any other time that Israel was committing war crimes in, in, the, in the Gaza Strip, Palestinians inside Israel were also part of that struggle. I think, it's, I think we do a disservice if we somehow imagine that Palestinians were behind this fictitious green line and therefore not subjected to Israeli racism and apartheid because we feel it on a daily basis. That being said, what I think is very important now, and I, I share your, your views, Fadi, is that we really are at a watershed moment. We're now at a place where we see that human rights organizations are finally repeating what Palestinians have been saying for a long time, which is that this is apartheid and that this is a settler colonial regime. And the apartheid label is no longer just applicable to the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, but they're now recognizing that that there's also apartheid inside Israel, the place where I live, whether it's through the legal structures that exist or through the policies that exist, that all of us are affected. And we as Palestinians now are at a place and at a space where we have to be pushing and shifting and changing and defining our own narrative so that we are able to, to push through, not so that our voices are now palatable or able to be heard by the West, but we have to make our own, take our own destiny and push it forward using our own language for our own struggle. Thank you, Deanna. And I want to follow up on some of those points, but I, I'm, I'm going to turn to you, Peter, because you live right and reflect on the realities in the US. And one of the things that, that we go back and forth on is, is there a shift in how this issue is being talked about, thought about, organized around? Are we maybe kidding ourselves? The US obviously casts an oversized shadow in its policy on this question. Could you just give a sense of, of, of what, what you think is going on, including in, in a Jewish community in America, which you're very familiar with, not least as editor of Jewish Currents? Thanks. Um, what we've seen is, in terms of American public opinion over the last 20 years, a dramatic bifurcation. 20 years ago, both Democrats and Republicans said they favored Israel over the Palestinians by about 40 points. According to Gallup's poll last week, among Republicans, it's up to 64-point 64 64 gap. The de among Democrats, the gap has er been erased completely. Among, among liberal Democrats, they now favor the Palestinians by 24 points. Shibli Telhami's polling finds that a clear majority of Democrats support sanctions against Israel over settlement growth. And if you ask Democrats whether what they would do if there were no longer a two-state as a possibility, they overwhelmingly, 80% almost, support one equal state over a Jewish state in which Palestinians don't have citizenship, millions of Palestinians don't have citizenship. So there is a dramatic bifurcation in American public opinion. Now, why is this happening on the American left? I think two reasons in particular stand out. The first is, that over the last 20 years, Israel has really morphed from being a foreign policy issue in the United States into being a culture war issue. In many ways, the Israel debate in the United States has a lot of the same features as the abortion debate, the gun debate, the vaccine debate. It's less a question in some ways about our foreign policy towards another country and more a question of what country Americans want to be. Benjamin Netanyahu bears a significant amount of responsibility for that because he didn't code in the United States in many ways as a foreign leader, right? He looked like the Republican senator from Israel. He's born in the United States, married in the United States, went to high school, college, graduate school in the United States. First, when he has supported the Iraq War, he looked like the, um, the Israeli Dick Cheney. Then he looked like the Israeli Donald Trump. And more profoundly, Israel now serves as a kind of a utopia for conservative Americans and a dystopia for progressive Americans. What do conservative Americans want, white conservative evangelicals? 
a country with a clear ethno-religious identity enshrined in law with immigration policies that maintain that demographic majority and, and a clear set of hierarchies, legal hierarchies, between dominant and less dominant groups. That's what Israel has. Ann Coulter, who yeah, I would not rec recommend you read her book, uh, Adios America, but it was, I think, the most influential book for Donald Trump. Uh, and what she says again and again is, we want Israel's immigration policy for us. For progressives, as the Democratic Party has become more and more non-white and more and more secular, Israel increasingly represents the dystopia, a country that's not a state for all its citizens, a country that is the opposite of what Democrats want for the United States. The second reason, I think, for this shift has to do with the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement and the Me Too movement, which has created a reckoning in progressive institutions, especially the media, over questions of representation. It's much harder now to have conversations in American media about black people in which black people are not in the room and on the, on the op-ed page or on the TV station. Similarly with women, similarly with LGBT folks. That sensibility, that embarrassment about talking about people without having them being part of the conversation, I think has started to filter down to the Israel-Palestine debate. For years and years and years, the dominant mode in the American media was basically within a Zionist narrative. Basically what you do is you have a progressive Jew and a more hawkish Jew discussing Israel-Palestine, and their disagreements would frame the debate. This, I think, has really started to change. There are many, many more Palestinian voices, and it changes the conversation completely. And I think Palestinians helped to bring that about because since Palestinians were excluded from the mainstream media, they invested in social media and developed a strong identity and kind of base on social media. But m mainstream media and social media increasingly have converged. I mean, most producers and bookers and op-ed editors sp spend their time on Twitter. So the impact of people like Mohammed al Kurd on Twitter comes back as a backdoor into the mainstream media. So I'll just close on the question of whether any of this matters for U.S. policy, right? Um, there is now clearly a very large gap between where Democratic politicians are and where Democratic voters are, not nearly as big a gap in the Republican Party. So if Democrats take and hold power, they will be increasingly pressured to shift from a position of unconditional U.S. support. But for Democrats to be able to win elections and hold power in the United States in the years to come, America has to be a democracy, which is very, very much up in the air at this point. The Republican Party, recognizing that the demographic changes in the United States are unfavorable to them, has moved in a very deep American tradition to make it hard for black people to vote and to say that any election in which black people choose the, the winner will be considered illegitimate and will be tried to overturn. The most significant, one of the most significant things that just happened was that APAC announced in its endorsements more Republicans than Democrats, and most of the Republicans were, in, were people who had supported the overturning of Joe Biden's election. What that suggests is that APAC recognizes it's much easier to maintain U.S. support for Israel if Israel, if Republicans win, and for Republicans to be in power, American democracy has to fail. If, if, America, if, it, if black people can put in for black and Hispanic people to vote, it's going to be very difficult for Republicans to hold power. It's going to be very difficult to maintain the, the, the unconditional U.S. support for Israel. So I think where we are in this interesting moment in the United States now is that there is a kind of parallelism between Israel, Palestine, and the United States, in which the struggle for equal citizenship and democracy in the United States is in some ways the same struggle as the struggle for equal citizenship and liberal democracy in Israel, Palestine. Thank you, Peter. I'm, I'm just going to know if, if it's possible, which I don't know if it is, for folks at the back to, to some people to migrate down to, to either side, that might allow more people to filter in at the back, but that's, that's a happy problem to have. Um, Sadie, you actually left the cabinet in the context of a government policy during the 2014 Gaza crisis that you couldn't support. We've heard Peter on America. I wonder if you could reflect on how that same debate plays out in the UK in policy making. And, and perhaps that reference to cultural wars, is that something that we're seeing in the UK as well? Um, thank you, Daniel. And, um, I, and I'm delighted today that we started with the Palestinian voices because as so often I think uh, Peter referred to it and Diana referred to it as well. This almost seems to have been uh, a conversation that takes place 
outside. And so I think if I go back to 2014, which is when I resigned um, from government, uh, I made it clear at the time that my resignation was not because of what Israel was doing to the Palestinians, however appalling that was. My resignation was my country not implementing its own foreign policy in relation to uh, the Middle East. Um, and I think it's really important that when we talk about this in Western capitals and, and in, in our democracies, that we do so from a position starting not so much with the new narrative, but starting with the old narrative of what is our official stated policy and what is it that we are doing to implement our own stated policy. And, and when I realized that actually the policy that we had on the Middle East as the British government, uh, and I, I was at the time uh, a foreign minister, uh, was, was, was in a good place, the challenge we had was that we were not doing anything that we were saying we should be doing in relation to our own policy. Um, and at that point, I felt that I had no alternative but to, but to stand down. Um, so where are we now? I think where, where the U.S. is, uh, Peter, is far uh, further than where we are. So we have had a challenge in uh, British politics. Um, I think the uh, issues that we've had within the Labour Party has meant that the normal challenge that would come from the left of politics on this issue uh, has been stifled. Uh, the, the policy remains the same across both political parties, but there seems to be no sense of urgency, uh, certainly not in the, uh, on the right of politics, and I would say even less on the left of politics, uh, to do anything about progressing our official policy. I think what is challenging, and I think this is where you're bringing the issue of the culture war, is what does it mean to be an equal citizen of a nation? And that is a debate as uh, Western uh, countries have uh, ever increased ethnic minority communities. And those ethnic minority communities are finding their space in those societies about who they are, what their rights are, how they exercise their rights. Uh, it is difficult for the government or governments of, of any color really to have very clear policies about how they feel we are all equal citizens above, uh, before an equal law and then have a foreign policy which seems to fly in the face of that. And I think more recently I would say that what has been a, a real spotlight and much more difficult for Western governments and certainly the United Kingdom for us to start to square this circle is and we've seen this here at the Doha Forum where it's been referred to over and over again. When we look at the unfolding uh, war in Ukraine, and we look at all the things that we have had to do in response to the invasion and occupation of a sovereign, attempted sovereign, uh, uh, attempted occupation of a, a sovereign state, um, all those things that we said in the West were too difficult to do, we are doing. Uh, you know, it was too difficult to impose sanctions, we did. Um, in the U.S., um, we um, criticized and undermined the International Criminal Court, and yet now we have found a way in which we can refer these disputes to the International Criminal Court. And, and domestically, this has been a, a challenge around um, the, in the past when people have s spoken about uh, boycotts and sanctions um, and have referred to these matters in sports, uh, there's been a big argument about how we shouldn't politicize sport, and yet we're managing to do that now. We've, we've even had conversations about whether or not uh, people should be able to express their political views in schools. And in the United Kingdom, we have a program which, uh, during the recent uh, conflict in, in, in Israel and Palestine, young children were referred to a formal process because there were concerns about whether these children were extreme because they were talking about the Palestinian issue and now almost every school is talking about the, the Ukraine-Russia issue. So I think that the sense of um, a government's view that it cannot do certain things has been, has been quite rightly shown not to be correct and a sense that society shouldn't be responding to disputes far away uh, based upon our own equalities framework, again, has been challenged. Um, I think politically, I'm, uh, I'm um, less optimistic, I would say, uh, than, than you, Peter. Uh, I would say that um, to, to, to my Palestinian uh, friends on this, um, uh, on this panel, that I think the concept of you having to take agency has absolutely got to be the right way forward. But what we can do, certainly in, in the United Kingdom, 
is to, first of all, start with the old narrative of saying, this is our official stated policy. We believe that these settlements are illegal. We believe that equal people are equal before the law. We believe that people should be punished when they commit um, international human rights um, uh, abuses. Um, and this is the framework that exists for us to do that. And we're showing that in, uh, in Ukraine, we're managing to do that. So trying to hold our own government's feet to the fire, I think, will be a start. That is a start. And, and, and thank you all. I think it's been a great start to our discussion. And thank you, Saida. I, 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 I do want to pick up on, on something that, or just acknowledge something. And, and maybe I'll start with you, Fadi, because you do campaign in a global setting, both in your Palestine work, but also... Uh, in your other things, Avaz hat. Because we've looked at the UK and the US. Let's talk about other parts of the world, though, um, sometimes referred to as the global south. Is, and it, it feels like, in governmental terms, and not least in this part of the world, there has been a decline in salience and in support and in solidarity with the Palestinians. Is, is that something, do you think, reflects accurately where people are at? And is it something that can be turned around? And anyone else can come in on this as well. Thanks, <clears throat> Daniel. What I would say is, based on the campaigning we do across the Middle East and North Africa, and also across the Global South, from South Africa and Kenya to um, even, even India, and to, to a large extent, those areas, the support for Palestine is actually increasing uh, within the population. We can even do a test right now. Raise your hand in the audience if you believe Israel is practicing the crime of apartheid against the Palestinian people. There you go. Um, almost unanimity. And I know the people who didn't raise their hands are mostly American diplomats. Yeah. Just joking. <laughs> just, just joking. Um, and so, so, I think, I think that showed you that there is a shift happening. Now, of course, though, what we need to be clear is that in, in changing political dynamics, although this is hopeful, politics is about power. And in the end, even if you have hundreds of millions of people across the world supporting Palestine, if that is not translated on the political level, um, it's, not, it's almost useless. But it can be translated on the political level. That's part of the conversations we're having here. That's part of the conversations we're having globally. And I would argue here that one thing that needs to happen, particularly given that we're, we're in Doha and we're in the Gulf, is that there needs to be a new rise in Arab consciousness. One of the challenges that I have faced in speaking with particularly young Arabs across the region and those in policy-making decisions is actually, although the love and solidarity for Palestine is there, the awareness and detailed knowledge of what's happening in Palestine is very low. And I think we need to really invest in shifting that because part of building political power is building a sense of agency within um, Arab communities and within communities in the global south. And the last point I will add is allyship. Uh, I was in a conversation with people from across the world, from Kashmir, and we were speaking to Gaza from this location right here. And the truth is that there are different struggles across the world happening today, whether it's the indigenous communities in Brazil, whether it's people in the townships in South Africa, they're all interconnected. The same companies that are imposing surveillance on Palestinians are also shutting down human rights activists in the Arab world. And I think one of the things we need to build is not just allying ourselves to liberate Palestine, but building alliances to liberate all of us from these systems of oppression that are uniting against us. Thank you, Fadi. If, if anyone else wants to come in on that, otherwise I was going to do a, a quick round and you could comment on that as well, because you mentioned something, Saida, and, and, and maybe I'll start with you on this, uh, regarding the Ukraine crisis. And, and I think I'm not Palestinian. It, it's, it's the issue that I'm deeply steeped in. Um, but I think listening to the rhetoric around Ukraine in the West, there is a staggering tinnedness. There is a, st a staggering lack of self-awareness even, whether conscious or not, if one is Palestinian or thinks deeply about that issue, but many other issues around the world, when it comes to this attempt to portray things through 
a values, norms, international law framework, which is so selectively and sparingly applied. And, and, and I've heard some arguments here that this is an opportunity. I must admit, my starting point is it's, it's par for the course. And unfortunately, I don't think so. But I wanted to do a quick round of either is this an opportunity or where could the opportunity be teased out in this respect? And turn to you first. I, I think the fact that um, uh, some of our policy making um, in Western capitals is hypocritical is not something that's new. And that's harsh for me to say, both as an ex-foreign minister, but also somebody who is deeply um, committed to the positions that in the past my country have taken. Uh, but I think the challenge becomes uh, real when that hypocrisy becomes so overt and so obvious that it's almost difficult to try and frame it in any sort of logical, reasoned argument. And I think where Ukraine presents so boldly, so soon after Afghanistan, so soon after what we saw in Syria, um, and that allows us to therefore reflect back on those um, wars and challenges, but also then allows us to reflect on what's going on in, in, in Israel and Palestine. I think it becomes untenable. I think it's what Peter was referring to earlier, that there comes a point, a tipping point. We're not at that, by the way, in the UK. I think we're still heading down the wrong path for a while. But there comes a point when, electorally, it becomes untenable for you to ignore the obvious and justify the hypocritical. And I think the Ukraine war presents as one of those moments. Thank you, Peter. The problem we have in the US is that when the conversation moves from domestic policy to foreign policy, the people of color leave the room, generally. Um, it's, it's really pretty dramatic. Um, and so what you have when you get into a foreign policy debate is basically a debate of people who either who work on the, only on Europe. A lot of the most prominent influential voices on the war in Ukraine in the United States are people who don't write about the global south at all. And virtually nobody in, um, in that journal, very few people in that journalistic world, Mehdi Hassan is, I would say, one very important uh, uh, counterexample, generally think in terms of any kind of anti-imperial or anti-colonial perspective whatsoever. So there's a kind of a, a not an, an implicit kind of ghettoization that exists in the U.S. military, I mean in the U.S. media, um, uh, sorry, in which, in which basically I think black people in particular and other people of color are said, it's okay, you can go and write a column about how terrible the Republicans are with their new attack on voting rights. But when it comes to Ukraine, that's not your lane. Um, and I think that's really what has to shift. The foreign policy class in the United States really doesn't represent the diversity of, ex of experiences of Americans very well. And if it did more, I think there would be more of a sensitivity to the kind of the tenure you're talking about. You know, it ha there's certainly potential there, Daniel, but I'm very skeptical. And the reason that I am skeptical is that it didn't take Ukraine for the world to know that invading another country is wrong. It didn't take Ukraine for the world to know that bombing buildings in the Gaza Strip and flattening them is wrong. It didn't take the Ukraine for people to realize that turning 75% of the Palestinian population to refugees is wrong. It, it shouldn't take the Ukraine to, to be later be occupied for the world to recognize this is wrong. They recognize it's wrong. It's that, it's that there's a problem of power. Israel's got the power and Palestinians don't. And my, my job and our job here collectively is to raise up our power and to change our power so that people then make that, uh, so people then recognize that they also have the ability to change Israeli policy. Because if we simply just latch on to, well, this is what's happening in Ukraine, and it's clear that international law works when it comes to Ukraine, we're no better off than we were before this all began. I think the bigger thing is for us to really be pushing back, to empower ourselves, and for us to be leading our own future and leading our own destiny, and for us to be saying, this is exactly what we want, and no matter what we do, if you're our ally, you're going to support us. But for you to put conditions on your support for us is just not a place that we're willing to go any longer. Thank you. Right. And I would add to that. First, I have to say that 
all people deserve the right to self-determination and all people deserve freedom and peace. And what's happening in Ukraine is a travesty. And it must be clear, particularly coming from a Palestinian who's experienced something similar, that that is wrong. And I hope that the Ukrainian people manage to find peace. And the point I want to add on this aspect is how this relates to Palestine. I think there's, there's one strategic piece to keep in mind and one tactical. On the strategic level, what we're seeing in Ukraine is how the increasing multipolarity in the world, the shifting international order, is going to begin to make certain countries pay the price of this superpower struggle. And as we go in that direction, we all, particularly those of us living in what's termed the global south, we need to begin thinking how we're going to position ourselves from this battle. Otherwise, similar to what's happening to the Ukrainian people, we will, play, we will pay the price of this power politics. And this is a, a call here for us to begin thinking about key actors within the global south, whether it's South Africa and other countries, how they can reorganize so that we can protect ourselves from becoming victims to these vicious cycles, because that's sadly what the future seems to be moving towards. So that's on the strategic level. But on the tactical level, I do think there are some opportunities to think about based on what we've seen in terms of the reaction to Ukraine. So the first is to say, now that it's clear within the context of sports that when there's an actor committing key crimes, that it's all right to impose certain tactics to shame them, just like what happened with the rugby teams in South Africa during the apartheid regime. Here in Qatar and elsewhere, there needs to be a push to sideline, particularly Israeli teams that are supportive and engaging with uh, the apartheid regime on that front. And the other tactical bit is swift. Israeli banks, there's a subset of them that actually run the construction companies building the settlements in the West Bank. And there needs to be a push to ban these Israeli banks from the SWIFT system. And I think we can build with a lot of advocacy and hard work on some of the precedents set by Ukraine to also punish another invading actor, which is the Israeli military. And so I would say, again, it, it doesn't look rosy. What we have all, what's become clear to us is that there's hypocrisy and an extreme lack of self-awareness within the West when it comes to these issues. But I think it's on us to think about this strategically and tactically and figure out how we move within this new context. And one of the things that, as you will be well aware, that bumps up against those, ki those kinds of calls for holding Israel accountable is the attempt to conflate that universal standard with having a particular animus against Jews and with anti-Semitism. We heard yesterday uh, uh, the Emir in his opening comments talk about the twin hates of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and, 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 and make a strong point and make a strong point regarding um, this misuse, misappropriation of anti-Semitism doing a disservice to the strike, struggle against racism and anti-Semitism. I wanted to ask you, Peter, because it's obviously a, a, a space that, 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 that you're particularly familiar with, and, and, and also because I'm talking Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, you, Saida. Um, where do you see this debate going? In many ways, the most effective tool that has been deployed against Palestinian activism recently, in, in the, you know, not in the activism on the ground, but in the broader campaigning sphere, has, has been this. Is, is, are we locked in now to a shrunken space and a criminalization of Palestinian activism around this? I, I think it's no coincidence that this rise of efforts to define anti-Semitism, uh, to say that it is anti-Semitic to oppose the existence of a state that privileges Jews over Palestinians, has emerged at the same time that the two-state solution has died. Because I think that the uh, pro-Israel organizations around the world, certainly United States Jewish organizations, establishment Jewish organizations, recognize that as the two-state solution died, the natural response from people who believe in equality and who believe that all people deserve to be citizens of the country in which they live would be to say if Palestinians can't have their own state, they should be equal citizens in one state. And what the move to say that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism does is it says that if you make that move, and therefore you call for Israel to be an equal state rather than a state that privileges Jews over Palestinians, therefore you are, are an anti-Semite, which is 
actually utterly, profoundly perverse because it means that the only non-bigoted position you can hold is to support a status quo in which millions of Palestinians lack any citizenship and the other Palestinians have second-class citizenship, right? I mean, this anti-Semitism is, is wrong because bigotry is wrong. It's not wrong because Jews are any different than anyone else. Anti-Semitism is a form of bigotry and bigotry is wrong. So if you're using claims of anti-Semitism to lock in a status quo which is institutionalized bigotry because Jews have rights that Palestinians don't have, you are actually desecrating the entire understanding of anti-Semitism. Um, this is the situation that we have in the United States and it has the also the ironic effect that a very significant portion of the American Jewish community under the definitions of anti-Semitism that are pushed by many governments and by establishment Jewish organizations are ourselves anti-Semites. 25% of American Jews think Israel is an apartheid state. Among American Jews under the age of, of 30, it's probably close to 40%, right? So essentially what you have is an American Jewish leadership telling their own children that their children are anti-Semitic. It's not actually, I think, over the long term sustainable. I think it does profound harm, and I find myself, frankly, repulsed to see people who I know only are trying to support human rights for people who are being brutalized, being called by my community bigots against us when I know that they're not. Um, but I think ultimately, ultimately, we'll push past it. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We had a similar terrible moment during uh, the last uh, election where we have a, a, a political program in the UK called Question Time and the chairman of the board of uh, deputies uh, was a panelist on uh, Question Time and uh, she was asked some questions about Donald Trump and she just could not find the language to talk about anything negative about Donald Trump. And I know lots and lots of members of the British Jewish community thought that that was an appalling moment because uh, for an organization that seeks to set out to challenge anti-Semitism, it just could not find any conversation around some of the language that Donald Trump had used after terrorist attacks on uh, Jewish communities uh, in the United States. Uh, and so we're not quite where the US is on the kind of accusations of anti-Semitism, although the left of politics in the UK might say that uh, we are. Uh, but I think that there is a, um, a, a much larger conversation which is happening in the United Kingdom around uh, the definition of anti-Semitism and the definition of Islamophobia. Uh, the government has so far formally adopted the definition of anti-Semitism, but is resisting the adoption of the definition of Islamophobia. And I think this kind of disparity is starting to create a challenge in relation to who do we believe to be equal citizens uh, of, of, uh, of our countries. Uh, again, I think it goes back to the kind of general point that I was making right at the outset, which is these things are unsustainable. Uh, you can only uh, argue that the, that the unreasonable is reasonable for so long. And in an ever-connected world where we're not relying upon the mainstream media to get messages out, we're not relying upon just the BBC to go out and film and send out films of what is actually happening on the ground in many of these places around the world, I think it, it is untenable. And I think ultimately we have to exist in a, in a system where we feel that all citizens, whatever their religious or ethnic background, feel equally protected. I think from a very personal example, I talk about this often, I have fought probably what is now a 20-year campaign on the issue of Islamophobia within the United uh, Kingdom. My gr great-grandfather grandfather came from uh, Pakistan, uh, and Pakistan was formed as a nation state for Muslims in that part of the world, as well as having equal rights for every other community. Um, and I always say that for all my arguments on Islamophobia, I would never make the argument that if somebody criticized Pakistan, I would not accuse them of being Islamophobic. It just would never occur to me that the two were connected. And I often speak to my British Jewish friends and say to them that, you know, that is as absurd. If you, if you said to me Pakistan is making all these terrible decisions, as it sometimes does, on, on some of its communities and decisions it makes, I could give you a whole load of arguments back, but one of them would not be, well, you can't say that because that's Islamophobic. And I think it's important for us to continue to draw these parallel with, parallels with other places around the world to sometimes expose the absurdity of some of these arguments. So 
I'm going to thank you so much, Seda. I'm going to go to D Diana and, 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 and Fadi to wrap us up. And I know you're, you're going to comment on what we were just speaking about, Diana, but let me also pose this to you, which is, Fadi, you mentioned you know, the shifts in how the PA is viewed. And whether we see changes there or not, do you feel we are on the cusp or perhaps we've already passed that tipping point of seeing a shift in a different Palestinian uh, strategy that's, that's at least coming from civil movements in terms of how we approach this? And that, does that begin to address power dynamics? Does that begin to succeed in putting accountability, disincentives, impunity when it comes to Israel in the frame? And, and if you wanted to reflect on the last, and then Fadi and will that will 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 run out of time. Okay, so I'll be quick. I, I think we in this discussion, I think we also need to really start centering Palestinian voices. And what I mean by that is so much of these accusations that are are uh, leveled by uh, pro-Israel supporters are actually masking anti-Palestinian racism, and we really need to start putting that term up front and center. For example, during 2021, as Israel was bombing, flattening entire buildings in the Gaza Strip, people uh, in various news channels were blaming Palestinians for their own deaths. They were blaming us for Israel bombing, flattening entire neighborhoods. That's a form of anti-Palestinian racism, and we have to call it out. When Israel passes a law that says, for example, that the reason they're passing the law is to preserve a Jewish demographic majority. We have to call it out for what it is, which is anti-Palestinian racism. When, when, when Israelis say that we cannot allow the right of return because it will upset uh, the, the, the state of Israel, we have to call it out for what it is, which is anti-Palestinian racism. It's time for us to re-seize this narrative and start putting it back to, and labeling it exactly what it is. Because all of this is simply used as a shield to protect Israel from criticisms, we have to call it out for what it is, which is anti-Palestinian racism, and say it over and over and over again. Now, when it comes to the PA, I think that we're in a place where, I don't know if Fadi shares my opinion, the, the PA has become functionally irrelevant. It's relevant for people in the, in the halls of power and so on, but for Palestinians on the ground, you actually see the number of the public opinion polls that are asking and showing that Palestinians want their leader to resign to resign. Two-thirds of Palestinians are saying it's time for Mahmoud Abbas to resign. It's not like, oh, you know, we don't like you. It's leave, please, exit. There's the door. And this is where we are now when it comes to Palestinian politics. But the Palestinian Authority continues to occupy too much space. And it continues to dominate the conversation, the narrative. So instead of people being able to express what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, it's shift to the Palestinian Authority and le let's see what the Palestinian Authority says. Now, I firmly believe that we as Palestinians have to seize this opportunity and change for our own destiny. Um, and this is a conversation that we as Palestinians have to have internally. But one thing I know for certain is that this Palestinian Authority cannot be reformed in any way, shape, or form to become reflective of what it is that we as Palestinians want. Thank you very much, Diana. Fadi, last word from you. Thank you, Daniel. And what I'll, what I'll end by saying, first on the question of anti-Semitism, I think it's a distraction that tries to polarize people around the ideas of ethno-nationalism, religion, Jews versus Palestinians, etc. And what I want you to leave this room with the frame of is this is really a struggle between people who believe that all persons deserve freedom, justice, and dignity, and those who believe that that's not the case, and that a certain people, because of their ethnicity or race or religion, are better than others. This is the main frame of this conflict. Anyone trying to reframe it for you in any other way is distracting you from the struggle that you should be having. The second point I want to say, in terms of Palestinian leadership, is that this is an internal conversation happening today, and I do believe 
that what you're seeing on the grassroots level across Palestine, and many of you have seen the courageous figures um, of people fighting day to day, leading their communities. And I want to name that there's an effort to arrest, to murder, to silence them. And Nizar Banat, who was a very outspoken Palestinian uh, leader who was trying to run for the legislative councils, was assassinated by the PA forces. Before that, Basil al-Araj, another young Palestinian who was one of the key people in bringing the rise of the new Palestinian consciousness, was assassinated by the Israeli forces. So there is an attempt today to prevent the rise of any new Palestinian voices in which both the PA and Israel are cooperating. And one of the things you can do is to help fight that because there's no bright future with the status quo dinosaurs as they exist today. And I'll end with this point of, of kind of a question for all of you, which is what will you do to support this cause? And the reason I say that is I want you all to know that you have a level of agency here as well. And Palestine, what's happening there, is one of the most just and moral struggles there are in our world today. And if we achieve a just solution for what's happening in Palestine, it will not only transform the Middle East, but I believe if we do it well, it will transform the world. And so this is a call to all of you to engage in this struggle, not as observers, but as part of it. And thank you. And I'll just add to that, that I hope you will take away from this, that you can have a panel on Palestine at a major conference that does not feel stale or worn or like we've listened to this a hundred times before and that can be inspiring and challenging and offer some hope for a way forward. And I hope you'll join me in thanking the panelists, Fadi, Diana, Peter, and Saida. Thank you.